to kind of answer questions and uh, different concerns that uh, they might have. Right, and then we have lots of clients who have many different questions, especially about, uh, I think, rural property. So I think we're just about ready to get started, Katie. Um, and one of the reasons why we do this as, as a mortgage center is what we found is that the realtors who attend these webinars, they're just better educated and they become better real estate agents. We actually enjoy working with them because they understand, I mean, um, realtors, don't need to know everything about mortgage financing. But if you just understand the general nuances of financing, it's a bit of a moving target. Don't you find, Katie, like we're getting different updates on a, on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So um, I don't know, Katie, you said you've worked here uh, for two years. What's the main, one of the main things that you uh, noticed that kind of struck you with the industry? Um, you mean just for, just working at a broker? Yeah. yeah. At, at, what, are, what are we get daily updates? Is was that tell tell me a little bit more about what you found interesting about the business? Um, just how many options there are. I I mean the the sky's the limit really when you come to a broker. It's there's so many different um, options, so many different ways we can kind of brainstorm and and put a deal together because um, we, we work with so many different lenders. Um, every file is different. Every file has its quirks, and uh, and it's it, nothing's ever the same. Nothing's ever cookie cutter. So it's always keeps it interesting. Yeah, th th this is an interesting business. So anyway, let's get started. So today's topic is how to avoid the most common problems of financing rural properties, and um, you know there are different types of rural properties. There are um, Rural residential, which typically is not a problem because they're zone residential, they're just in a rural area, just like uh, you would buy a property uh, here in Guelph or in a, in a major city. Um, then there is uh, the other type of property or zoning, I guess, would be agricultural. And there's different kind of variations of agricultural. For, for those of you, I don't know if you guys know that most of Puss Lynch is actually zoned uh, agricultural. So even if the property is clearly a house, like an executive uh, type of house on one or two acres, it's probably going to be zoned agricultural if it's in Puss Lynch. So some financial institutions, even though the pot property is perfectly residential, it has no sort of ideas about being agricultural and the zoning is agricultural, some financial institutions will still turn down the mortgage because of that. Um, and then in that agricultural uh, sector, there are hobby farms. So usually what I find, those are people who are moving from urban centers and they want a little bit more acreage and there's some additional outbuildings on the property. And the reason why these properties are, are sometimes a bit tricky to finance is if they are, the people who are purchasing these properties are expecting a residential mortgage. They have no um, notion of getting an agricultural type of a mortgage, even though it's a hobby farm and there's outbuildings. Where financing can be an issue on these properties is a lot of these properties have outbuildings where the total value of the property includes the outbuildings. So like a, a drive shed, um, a barn, something like that, maybe another um, structure on the property, maybe another home on the property. Um, so with these types of properties, again, the people who are buying these properties aren't expecting agricultural financing. Um, and, and so when we do get those types of properties appraised, the appraisers are just looking at the house plus 10 acres and no outbuildings. So sometimes it can be an issue with financing because the financing on, on these hobby farms, if the borrower is expecting residential type rates, is going to be the house plus 10 acres, no outbuildings right? So it might be a surprise to them how much they'd have to put as a down payment. But we discuss that all with clients. And then with agricultural, there is sort of the commercial uh, farm, be it cash crop, dairy, beef, you know, 
although we don't specialize in those types of properties, like usually uh, if somebody is buying a commercial operation, they're going to go to farm credit. Um, however, if you do have clients who do want to purchase an agricultural type property or even refinance, uh, like a, a true commercial agricultural operation. We have some excellent private lenders who will lend on those types of properties um, because their background is farming and they understand these operations. So again, agricultural, there's different variations of that. And uh, all you need to know is the variations. We take care of figuring out the financing. And then the other kind of issue that can come up with uh, sort of rural properties is commercial or central business district. So we've helped actually a few people this just recently and many, it's many first time home buyers. So what I'm thinking is it's just sort of like a, a small town. It's the main road of the, of the town. And, you know, there might be like a gas station, a small uh, grocery store, and then there's maybe five, 10, 20 homes on that main strip. A lot of those smaller properties actually may be zoned commercial. They are clearly not commercial. It's clearly residential, but the zoning is commercial or central business district, and that's going to be a problem with financing. Um, be, and I, I actually talked to a realtor not too long ago, and he said, "Damn, I wish I would have known that because I, I had a client who put an offer on the pro on a property, and it was declined by their existing lender. So we know how to put those uh, properties and get those mortgages financed. And the, one of the reasons why." lenders are particularly picky about rural properties and these are just some other considerations is because post covid the marketability will vary greatly for properties depending on their location so let me just repeat that so post covid the marketability of properties will vary greatly because of the location and so what we've seen is like a massive um sort of <laughs> net migration out of urban centers into rural areas, partially because of affordability. Many first time home buyers had to buy in rural areas and uh, to get into the housing market just because of affordability. And, and also to compound that uh, situation, many people had the opportunity to work from home. But this work from home scenario, many economists are saying is not sustainable. Um, and, and what we're finding is that as um, things open up in, in different uh, sectors, many employees, employers are asking their employees to come back to work in a hybrid model or even full time into the office. So that's why uh, many financial institutions are looking at rural properties um, with more scrutiny, like with more scrutiny, because when there is a softening in the market, rural areas will be affected the most um, and in, in, particular, in, in particular locations. So some of the other uh, considerations with rural properties and financing is potability test. That is normally not a condition for the mortgage broker, but uh, a solicitor condition. So you want to make sure that when you're taking a pot of water potability test, that it has to be clear because they're not going to get financing on the property. They probably will have trouble getting home insurance. But um, we just had an issue come up where the real estate agent didn't put the correct address on the potability test. And can you, everything's slower with COVID. So, um, you know, we had to close on the purchase and, and there were issues because the potability test didn't have the correct uh, address on, on, on that correct subject property address. So pay attention to this. The other consideration for rural properties is um, well and septic systems. And, and this relates specifically to alternative financing. What we found in our office is about 40% of our clients, and this would be a good sort of general um, reference to the entire market, is about 40% of the, our clients require alternative financing. And, um, and the main reason why they require alternative financing, not necessarily because of uh, credit history, but because they're self-employed and show low taxable income. And so, um, and because of that, 
financial institutions aren't looking at gross business income anymore, or they might have corporations where they keep money in a corporation. So we have to do alternative financing. And typically, um, companies who do the alternative financing require a minimum of at least 35% as a down payment on properties with well and septic systems. And obviously, um, they'll want an inspection on the septic system. There are often longer closing dates than urban. Like we could turn around financing and get a property closed within 30 business days, within, within the month, um, and depending on how quickly the lawyer can work. But typically, what we're finding is that with rural properties, the closing dates are a little bit longer just because of the extra due diligence. And oftentimes, it may have to do with getting an appraisal on the property. And I wanted just to talk to you a little bit about this. Like, we can often, if the customer is cooperative and we get um, 80, we get probably the majority, we, Katie, wouldn't you say that we get good income information most of the time up front with customers? Because I know you're reviewing income in information. So um, we can normally get clients um, to a position where they can um, not have a financing condition. But in rural properties, a must, especially if there's acreage or if there's something quirky about the property, we require a condition for an appraisal. And it, depending on the remote location, it could take up to two weeks to get an appraisal. Right? The last consideration, I'm going to have Katie talk a little bit about this because she has some excellent experience on home insurance. Katie, did you want to chat, talk, talk to us a little bit about the home in, uh, insurance and how that affects um, things with financing? Yeah, so um, uh, as I said at the beginning, um, that I, my background is in home and auto insurance. So I have some uh, years experience doing home insurance. And um, I know that uh, it can be quite difficult to uh, get home insurance on uh, these types of rural properties, especially if they're older. Um, some main things to consider would be uh, the plumbing and electrical uh, plumbing. If there's galvanized plumbing, that's that's typically an issue. Um, knob and tube wiring on older homes. Um, both uh, insurance companies that I used to work for, um, the knob and tube had to be completely um, removed uh, in order to uh, get a policy with those uh, types of companies. Um, homes over 100 years, some companies may not even uh, insure homes over 100 years old, uh, also if they're considered a heritage building. Um, the roof age and furnace age are important. Um, they typically, uh, for your standard insurance companies, um, 25 to 30 years old uh, is kind of a maximum. Um, wood stoves can be an issue uh, if they're not wet certified. Also, if they are located in a detached structure, uh, a lot of these uh, rural properties may have that heating type in a detached structure, which can be a problem. Um, they may uh, often will ask for an inspection of the property um, if it is older uh, and things often come up. Uh, if there's any structural damages, um, the liabilities may not be um, up to date with current guidelines. Um, for example, um, they may require you to put in um, certain railings on steps uh, just to kind of keep it um, up to date. There's no liability issues. Um, and yeah, so, so several different things to consider if the home is older or in a, in a rural area like that. That's great. I mean, do you have a couple of questions that I wanted just to address? So one of the questions is, uh, so if a, a person wanted to purchase a property and say they have 10 acres and they wanted the business to buy it, what are some of the problems with financing? Well, one of the things that would not typically happen is if you owned an operating company, your operating company would not typically buy a property. So what we would normally do, and this would be something that we would work in conjunction with a, your um, accountant is that usually when a property is purchased, it's purchased in a holding company, which is separate from the operating company. So we have um, had people buy uh, properties. So the typical setup would be if somebody uh, wants to uh, have a, has an operating company and they're wanting and they've got lots of money in the operating company, but they want to um, use that money and purchase real estate. 
and um, they don't actually want the money to leave their operating company so it doesn't um, appear on their personal tax returns. So normally what we would do there is the accountant and the lawyer would set up a holding company. And um, usually, I hope this answers your question, is that we would not have an operating company purchase a, pro a, a residential property. If it was a commercial type of property or maybe like an investment property, that would always be put in a holding company. And then uh, another question, Katie, I may, might defer this one to you, is it talks about uh, insurance and aluminum wiring. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, typically, homes in uh, the 70s had uh, the aluminum wiring, and um, it can be difficult uh, to kind of get insurance with your standard in insurance companies. The companies I worked for did not like aluminum wiring at all. Um, some companies will just kind of want it to be inspected, just get an electrical certification. Um, I should mention that all the kind of issues I mentioned before, they, it is possible to get insurance, but that your uh, customers may want to be flexible. Um, they may need to go to a broker and they may need to find kind of an alternative um, insurance. They might not be able to get it with your typical all state, state farm type. Um, they may have to go somewhere else and, and their uh, premium might be higher. Um, so aluminum is okay, it just depends on the company. Um, some say no, some say uh, just get it certified and um, um, other ones may be completely fine with it. They just might be a higher premium. And we have some excellent contacts like our, our two, um, we can offer in clients a home insurance product, um, however, uh, through our network, however, like we are go to uh, insurance brokers when we have problems is, is broker link. Um, and the fellow that we usually uh, use there is Michael Duragon and he's always been a really great resource. So. Um, no, Katie, I'm going to kind of turn things over to you, and um, I wanted you to kind of review this idea of purchasing over a million, because most properties are over a million, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, we're seeing more and more homes over a million, um, even in Guelph here, just on your, in the city, um, and uh, different lenders will have um, a different amount that they require down. Uh, it's called a sliding scale. And um, different lenders that we work with have different sliding scales. So I've got two examples to kind of go over with you on the next slide here. Um, so for example, we've got two different lenders here. They require two different um, down payments. It often depends on the value of the home, but mainly where it's located, if it's rural or if it's more of an urban property. Um, so for example, lender A requires 20% uh, down on the first 1 million and then 50% down on the remaining balance. So the calculation down here, 20% uh, on the first million is 200,000. And then the 50% of the 200,000 remaining is another 100,000. So this lender requires a down payment of 300,000, which is, it can be more than what your client expected. Um, lender B over here requires 20% down on the first 750, um, but then 50% on the balance. Uh, so down here, you can see the 20% of the first 750 is 150,000 and 50% of the remaining 450 is 225. So they require a down payment of 375. And this could be for the same property. Um, so we would just kind of work with the client and just see what works best for them. Lender B might be a better rate, um, but they do require require a higher uh, down payment. So if, if people have that much to put down then and they're more rate uh, conscious, they may wanna go with this option. Um, obviously, if the uh, customer only has 300,000 to put down, we would go with lender A. So that's kind of where we come in to, to work with them and find out what works best. But it, it is often, um, it can be a surprise that they have to put more than 20% down. Right, that's excellent. And I know, um, I just wanted to remind the realtors um, that you cannot get an insured mortgage if the purchase price is over a million. Now, um, that was an election promise, and there's some um, talk about raising that um, sort of ceiling to purchases at over 1.25 million, where you can get an insured deal. But this uh, sliding scale will, I'm, I'm sure even if they do raise the limit on, on prices, purchase prices over a million, where the 
deal can be uh, where the mortgage can be insured against default, which means that customers can put less than 20% down and still get the insurance premium. I feel like a sliding scale will will still still somehow apply. So I, I didn't we didn't want to kind of get too technical on you, but um, to Katie's point, like maybe Katie, I can you can just kind of express your own um, <laughs> ideas about sending your cli clients to a mortgage broker versus a bank. Yeah, I think the the biggest one would be um, options uh, because we work with so many different lenders. Um, we can kind of find the right product in terms for each client's specific needs. Um, we have access to different rate specials, uh, special programs. I know we're working with someone now who's a veterinarian and we found um, a lender that has a vet program. So that was kind of cool. Um, we can find out who has the best sliding scale if they are purchasing a property over a million and they ha only have a certain amount down. Um, we can also see if different lenders can make exceptions. Um, we can kind of paint a picture to the lender of the whole file and the strength of the file and um, see if we can get certain exceptions made. Um, sometimes we can get exceptions on the down payment or uh, the sliding scale as well, different amortizations, um, if they need a longer amortization um, and different terms that they prefer. Um, so working with a broker can kind of, um, we can kind of work out those those different uh, scenarios for people and find them different options and exactly what they want. Um, we'll often send a file to several different lenders um, just to kind of be able to pr present the customer with multiple options and they can kind of choose what they prefer. Um, we're also very flexible and very pretty quick. And we have people that call and think that uh, it's going to be like a standard bank where they're going to call and it's going to take us several weeks to get back to them um, when we often can get back to them in just a couple of few business days. So um, they're often pleasantly surprised with how quick we can kind of turn things around. Um, the alternative financing is a big one as well. We work with many different alternative lenders um, so we can do some brainstorming and often if they have 15 or, or mostly for 20% down, we can pretty much uh, find a solution for anybody. And um, as well, we've got private lenders uh, that we work with. Um, so we work with customers that may have, they may not show a lot of income on their taxes because they're self-employed. Um, we can, we have different alternative financing options for them as well. Um, one good thing for realtors is that you can actually send us an MLS listing. Um, if your customer is interested in a property and you're not sure if it's how the financing is going to work, if there's going to be any issues, you can send us the MLS. We'll run evaluation. We'll check out the property, see if we anticipate any issues with it and how the financing would work. Um, so I think realtors um, really appreciate that aspect uh, with working with us. And I don't think we've met a customer in person at our office since uh, February 2020. So the crazy thing about it is um, we've got a really great system um, that we've refined where we can collect uh, clients' information. They can upload their documents into a, a secure uh, portal, and we actually do all appointments virtually. And I, I really actually enjoy that because while, the cust while we're meeting the customer, we're taking notes, um, and then we can send them like a summary of sort of what their options. So it's very fast and easy for borrowers and, and, and they just love it. And I think too, with the pandemic, people have become more used to technology. So it just accelerated things. I was just talking to a friend um, that actually worked at a bank and was a mobile mortgage specialist. And just recently, Katie, they were allowed to do e-signatures. So imagine like if someone walked into a bank, like, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be stuck in a room with somebody signing mortgage documents. It's just, you know, think, things have really changed in the last couple of years. So um, we do have a really great mortgage app. Um, and um, I know that uh, many of you have already downloaded it. If uh, you just go to our website at skipthebank.ca and it's a top right hand corner, you can download the app. Uh, you can run quick pre qualifications for customers. You can even do it for yourself. I mean, that's part of our job. Customers love it because they have real time updates on what's happening with interest rates. So people are always curious about what's happening with rates. Um, they, they can get 
that there. And um, I do have a couple of other questions that have come up. I do have somebody asking about sort of the math and the sliding scale. Uh, the other really cool thing about how we're working right now is you can actually go to our website at Skip the Bank and, and book an appointment from there. So I would encourage that uh, person who asked about not understanding the math around the sliding scale, or if any of you do have any additional questions where you'd like to um, review a typical uh, uh, a scenario for a potential client, just go to our website at skipthebank.ca and there's a, a link there where you can schedule an appointment. Um, Katie, can I turn things over to you about the wrap things up? Um, yeah, so uh, I, like I said, I was a, a client of the Mortgage Center before I worked here, so I can speak to the good work that we do here. Um, I, I remember uh, working with Sandra and um, thinking that I was the only customer she was working on. Um, she, I would be panicking about a home we were purchasing and she'd call me, you know, late at night one night. And, um, I, I told her, I, am I the only customer you're working on? Cause that's what it seems like. And then now that I'm working here, I see how many files that there, that we actually work on at the same time. So, um, uh, that was a surprise to me how many uh, files we work on, but, you know, we make, try to make each customer feel like they're they're the only one and um, give them the time that they need. So um, it's easy to do a, a Google review for, for anyone who kind of has had a great experience with us. Yeah, and if you appreciate the information that we give, we would also uh, appreciate a Google review and some feedback on that. So I think that wraps things up for today. Um, Thanks, Katie, for sharing your input and your information. Um, we've got a great team here at the Mortgage Center who just has a tremendous amount of knowledge and also um, attention to detail and actually cares about the, the well-being of the customer. So um, if you do have a, a client that you'd like us to speak to, the easiest way uh, to get that done is just do an email introduction and we'll take it from there. And we always keep the real estate agent in the loop with what's happening with the financing so um so that you're aware of what stage we're at so anyway you guys have a good day and thanks so much for joining us